on the mystic lands of British Columbia this morning is Associate Professor Pascal Hagley is chatting to us about whether or not airbags lead us to make riskier decisions. Um, he holds the NSERC Industrial Chair in Avalanche Risk Management, and his research objective is to interface between natural and social science to find innovative solutions to today's avalanche safety problems. So let's welcome Pascal. Thank you very much, Sherry, for this very nice introduction, and thank you to all of you guys for coming out. It's a, it's a real pleasure to come down here from Vancouver and present some of our research to you guys. So as Sherry, uh, Sherry said, I'm going to talk to you about sort of avalanche airbags and how they might affect our behavior when we're traveling in the backcountry. Uh, avalanche airbags have now been around for a few decades, and even though their sort of uptake was fairly slow, especially in North America, they sort of established themselves as a fairly um, well-known, effective additional uh, safety tool for backcountry travel. How many in the room here travel with avalanche airbags if they go into the backcountry? Wow, so probably about half, which is a lot more than a few years ago. Um, one of the reasons why there is such an uptake in avalanche airbags is that they're actually, they're really effective. And uh, there's been a bunch of research studies over the last few years that sort of looked at how effective they actually are, and I had the pleasure to be part of one of them, and I think it was three years ago at this event when I actually presented those results. And in our study, we showed that for, in, for individuals that are seriously involved in avalanches of size two or larger, uh, having an inflated airbag actually reduced their mortality from 22 down to 11%. So it basically reduced mortality by half, which is a, a dramatic uh, improvement. The biggest hurdle for that effectiveness was people not inflating their own airbag. Um, during the incident, and so if you took that into account, uh, it reduced the effect, uh, it, it just reduced the mortality from 22 to 13 percent, so not quite by half. But still, like, that's a dramatic improvement in the mortality when you're involved in an avalanche, and so there's, there's strong reasons to uh, buy into the concept of avalanche airbags. Now, despite this uh, proven effectiveness, there is sort of the nagging concern that this additional sort of sense of safety might actually make people expose themselves to, to more serious avalanche conditions than they would normally do without an airbag. And that behavior is known as risk compensation or risk homeostasis, uh, and I'm sure that many people in here uh, have heard about that concept before. It's basically that we sort of, we have this target risk level and we adjust our behavior uh, to hit that level regardless of how many additional safety uh, devices you add to it. So that's been a sort of a serious concern around uh, avalanche airbags and maybe some of the people in the audience here haven't bought an airbag exactly because of that. And so for me as a researcher, I've always been sort of curious, well, how big is actually that effect? Huh? Now, trying to do research on this is not new. There's actually been a few studies in the past that, that try to sort of get a better handle on this, um, this effect. And uh, there's been three ISW presentations around that. Um, the first two, without going into too much detail, uh, actually compared owners or the behavior and the, the preferences of owners of airbags versus non-owners of airbags. Uh, and while that, these studies have provided some sort of meaningful insights, they don't really prove risk compensation because they simply show that maybe the buyers of airbags are a different backcountry user group than the non-buyers. To really properly uh, look at risk compensation, you have to look at the same people before and after they bought their airbag. So that simply having an airbag changed their behavior. And this is what sort of the last study here by Terry Island actually did, and he presented that study at the last ISSW in Breckenridge in 2016. And what he did was that he had an online survey and he presented people with a one 
avalanche scenario, basically presented them with a slope uh, that they had to, uh, to ski. And he asked them, uh, what is your sort of threshold, hazard threshold, where you would still choose to ski the slope on a scale from one to 10? And after they assessed the space scenario, he then modified that scenario. And one of the modifications was that he gave people an airbag and an avalanche. And he said, now that you've known um, that you have this additional safety device, what's your sort of hazard threshold now? And in his study, 60% of the people actually chose a higher threshold than they did without airbags. And a good chunk of that sample were people who didn't own an airbag themselves. So I think that was some interesting results there that sort of highlights that there is definitely the potential for uh, this risk compensation behavior. But he only had them assess one scenario, and to me that seemed a little bit weak for sort of making conclusions or drawing conclusions for backcountry recreationalists in general. So the goal of our study was to try to provide a more comprehensive perspective on that topic of airbags and risk compensation. So here are sort of the goals that we were, were after, like the questions that we were really curious about for our study. Um, what are the differences actually between owners and non-owners of airbags? Why do people buy airbags or what prevents them from buying one? What do people think is the effect of airbags with respect to risk taking? Do they personally are concerned about it? And then of course, do airbags actually affect uh, terrain preferences of people? And then in the end, do airbags affect the involvement frequency in uh, avalanche incidents. Now most of these questions you can, you can handle fairly easily in an online survey. You can simply ask people about it. The one here about terrain choices is a little bit more difficult and unfortunately the, uh, the university, the ethics board at the university doesn't really allow me to do proper experiment where I go out in the field and like, take this airbag, now let's see what you're gonna do. Uh -huh. so, so I'm kind of stuck with this survey methodology. Um, now, there is actually a technique that gets us fairly close to the real sort of decision scenarios uh, or decision situations that we face when we go into the backcountry, and it's called a discrete choice experiment. It was developed in the transportation uh, research, and I've used this technique actually a bunch of times to try to sort of look at decision making in the backcountry. And what it does is it provide, it basically presents a survey participant with hypothetical but realistic decision scenarios. And so this is the choice that we gave to our participants and we basically gave them a danger rating here at the top and then we gave them two out of bounds runs to choose from. And these out of bounds runs were characterized by the uh, incline of the out of bounds run, the, uh, the type of the terrain they would get into, the size of the terrain, and then how often that run is actually skied uh, and how many tracks they can see on the run. And I think we're, hello, somebody calling. Um, and their task was to choose which one they would prefer under the current conditions. And they, if they didn't feel comfortable with either of them, they could choose to stay in bounds. Now for the statisticians in here, there's a statistical design underneath this and the analysis, we can actually, in the analysis, we can then sort of identify the uh, contribution of each of these attributes to their decision. So how heavily they're influenced by that particular one. Um, what's special about our setup is that sort of the characteristics of the run were represented in this photo. Uh, in the North American version, we would have had here sort of double black diamonds and sort of our traditional uh, signs that sort of indicate the seriousness of an inbound ski run. Um, so, so this would sort of allow us to get a sense how aggressive people's choices are. 
And in the survey, uh, our participants actually had, we presented them with six of these scenarios. We had, I think, 96 different scenarios in total, and everybody got presented with a range of these scenarios, six of them in total. And we had the following setup to try to get at that risk compensation behavior. The first three, everybody would evaluate in their normal situation. So airbag owners, that participant, would simply fill it out thinking that they were using their airbags and um, non-owners would do it without. And then after the first three, we gave the non-owners an airbag. We saw, you now got from a friend, you got an airbag. And for the owners, we took it away from them. We said it's broken and it's in the shop and so you don't have it. And then we asked them to fill out another three of those uh, decision scenarios in that new situation. And that setup allows us to do a number of comparison. We can first sort of compare the owners with the non-owners directly in their normal situation. And then we can see how that additional safety device actually would affect their behavior. And if risk compensation holds true, then we would expect sort of more aggressive choices over here, and we would uh, expect more conservative choices over here. So that was the setup of our survey. Now, we conducted our survey in Switzerland in the uh, uh, spring of 2017. Uh, we used clubs to sort of promote participation and we had a nice draw prize to get people excited about it. Um, and in total, we had about 400 people participate in total. Uh, this slide here just shows you, sort of gives you an overview of that sample that we had. It's predominantly male, um, age distribution probably similar to in the room here. Uh, there was mostly Swiss. There was a slight preference towards out-of-bound skiing, and it was actually a fairly experienced group. Um, so a fairly good chunk of the sample had more than three, 10 winters of experience, and there were fairly uh, avalanche trained. Huh? We also asked them a bunch of uh, sort of motivation questions that allowed us to, to group participants in three sort of risk-taking classes. Huh? And so about a quarter of our sample was thrill seekers. So those were people are like skiing powder and skiing aggressive lines. That was sort of their main motivation. Uh, then we had sort of the powder seekers, about a third of our sample, uh, who are really primarily interested in skiing powder. Um, but we're fairly safety conscious. And then the rest was sort of the more conservative skiers that we had in our sample. Huh? So that just gives you a sort of a sense of uh, the sample that we had. Now let's look first at the difference between the airbag owners and the non-owners, huh? just to sort of get a sense of that. Owners were generally more male. Uh, they had a higher percentage of out-of-band skiers in there, and they were more experienced and more committed to the sport. So they were actually doing it more often uh, than the, the, the other side of the sample, so the non-owners. Huh? Interestingly, there was no difference in their risk attitude, and there was no difference really in um, their, um, the prevalence of their avalanche involvements. So overall, those two groups, owners and non-owners, were uh, involved in avalanches at about the same rate. But let's have a closer look at the avalanche involvements of the airbag owners. Huh? So out of our sample of, so we had 40% of our sample was uh, airbag owners, so 55 of them, uh, we had 55 airbag owners, and out of those, uh, 32 were involved in avalanche incidents. So that's about uh, a fifth of our uh, owner's sample. Now, since we asked them how much experience they have and when they purchased their airbag, we can actually look at when their involvement was, whether it was before or after their purchase. And out of the 32, 18 percent, or 18 of those involvements, so slightly more than half, were after they bought their airbag. 
And because we know when they bought the airbag, we can compare this with the years of exposure they had with and without airbags. And if we actually do a statistical test on that, we find out that there was a significantly higher percentage of involvements after they bought their Amalinch airbag. So that is definitely uh, some evidence that risk compensation might be happening. Now, if we split it up into those three different risk groups that I showed you earlier, we have a very interesting result. And it's that's the most, that the effect was the most significant with the most conservative group. And I think that's very interesting. So it wasn't sort of the thrill seekers where we generally expect that. Now, what did people think about the effect of airbags on risk taking? Uh, we asked them on a simple scale from one to four to sort of indicate how concerned they are that uh, avalanche airbags might result in uh, risk changes in their risk taking behavior. And overall, 87% said that it would affect, they think they would affect them at least a little bit. If we split this up into the users and non-users, it's interesting that this concern was a lot higher among non-users. Huh? And so maybe this sort of being less concerned by the airbag owners might be based either on personal experience or a little bit on wishful thinking. Now let's have a look at the uh, discrete choice experiment results. Huh? Just sort of recap those, those different comparisons. And let's first look at the comparison between uh, the comparison one here between the uh, users and the non-users. Here we did find sort of a, a slight preference of, non, of users to ski in more aggressive terrain. And that's what we would expect. We knew that they're more committed, they're more into out-of-bound skiing, they do their activity more often. So I think it makes sense that we would expect sort of more, uh, more aggressive terrain choices there. And probably they have the skill to actually manage those uh, choices better. Now if we look at the other two comparisons, unfortunately I have to say that the results were inconclusive. We didn't really find much. Some uh, of the results sort of seem to indicate that choices might be a little bit more aggressive, but others didn't seem to sort of show the opposite. And I think the main reason for that is that we simply can't recre recreate that sort of that decision situation in the same way in an online survey to sort of capture a subtle effect like risk compensation that really happens much more on the emotional level than sort of the conscious uh, analytical level. So I think we clearly sort of uh, highlighted a limitation of the method here. Now, we're luckily, at least for me as a researcher, we're not the only ones that have a challenge to actually prove uh, or provide evidence for that risk compensation. And there's a lot of other uh, research areas that had uh, similar challenges around that. And this is why James Hedlund in 2000 tried to come up with sort of an indirect way to look at the potential of risk compensation for new safety devices. And he came up, came up with this list of four questions that users as well as developers should sort of ask themselves when they sort of look at new safety devices and try to figure out how big that potential is of risk compensation. So let's go through those uh, four questions and sort of look how much uh, Avalanche airbags score on these questions. The first one is how obvious is the new safety device? And for airbags, they're really hard to ignore. So once you bought one, you know that it's there. It's very different from like shadow resisting glass in your car that you don't really recognize every time you hop into the car. But with an avalanche airbag, it's a pretty obvious safety device. The second question is how does the device actually affect you, like mentally, physically? Um, how does it um, affect your recreational experience? And I think with avalanche airbags, they do affect your recreational experience. 
uh, both when you buy them because they're quite expensive, but also when you use them because they're heavier than your old bag and they do require sort of constant att attention, like you have to arm them and charge them and do all that kind of stuff. So, so they do sort of affect your experience and as a result, you probably want to get a benefit out of using that device. Um, it was, yeah. The next question is how well does the benefit of the device actually line up with your motivation for the activity? And here, especially for the group that we saw that owns the airbag in our, uh, in our sample, those two things line up perfectly. It was the out-of-bound skiers that are highly interested in skiing challenging terrain. Um, and that safety device perfectly lines up with that. So they want to get that benefit out. So that's very different from somebody who just likes to be out in nature to, to uh, enjoy the backcountry. So there, there might be less, less potential for actually risk compensation. And then the last one, can I actually change my actions if I want to? And that's in the recreational context, that's a clear yes. So I think there is great potential here that risk compensation can happen, probably less so in the professional environment where you have sort of uh, procedures and policies that sort of restrict of how you can actually behave and how your risk uh, management procedures work. So we score on all four. Um, it's not great. So I think overall, even though our um, our discrete choice experiment didn't really work. I think we have some fairly strong direct and indirect evidence that risk compensation might be happening. Now this leads me to the question, is that a good argument for not using avalanche airbags? And I think my personal opinion here is no. Um, and I think we have to be honest that almost all avalanche awareness initiatives, whether it's avalanche safety courses or events like that, are actually trying to enable people to go out into the backcountry and enjoy it the way they want it. Uh, and avalanche airbags are just another tool like that. The critical thing, though, is that people should be able to make informed choices and they should know what they're getting into. And that brings me to my conclusions or recommendations, which is really that we should continue our research to better understand the effectiveness of airbags and know when they work and when they don't work so that people like yourself and myself, we can make informed choices about whether, when we want to use them and, and, and to what degree. I also think that the potential for risk compensation should be highlighted in courses and it should be included in sort of the background material for avalanche airbags so that clients there know about this potential and can sort of try to make choices around it. So that's it for me. Um, just quickly want to thank all the survey participants uh, and of course the sponsors of my research program at SFU. Uh, it wouldn't be possible to do this kind of research without them and we're very uh, gracious for their support. That brings me to the end. Thank you very much. Have a great start to the season.